We got Uber for you today, but with blockchain. So we thought, how about you pay an ETH and you log in with MetaMask? Wouldn't that be cool? That's what you're going to get. So let's just go right into the app and not waste a lot of time. I go into the app. I can log in with MetaMask. Boom. I'm already authenticated. You can see at the top right, I'm able to get in. Let's go to our database and our back end, restoring our users, rides, and trips, as you can see. And uh, every time you log in, it actually creates an account for you with your wallet address attached. So let's say my name was Bobby Adams. I could change it to whatever I want. Even clever programmer. I can hit publish. Once my sanity backend updates, when I go back to my database, we're good to go. You can see my name is now says clever at the top, you know, short for clever programmer. So it just shows the first name there. I want to ride. I want to go somewhere. Don't you? So I'm going to type in Santa Monica to let's go to SoFi Stadium. Now, as soon as I'm done typing that, look at that in real time. Santa Monica shows up. SoFi Stadium shows up and Mapbox automatically draws that out. And that happens without refreshing. And thank you, Next.js. On the left hand side, you see all the rides are there uber x uber xl black where are all those images and all those drive and those names coming from They're actually coming from our sanity database where all of this is stored now you're looking at the price that's interesting the price is in eth where's the price coming from price is actually being calculated fancy algorithm that will show you in the rest of this video that basically makes a realistic price that you pay but in eth That'd be cool, right? You order your ride, pay with ETH, boom, you're good to go. So let's go ahead and check it out now. So I'll pick black. We'll hit confirm. Our MetaMask pops up to authenticate that transaction. We go ahead and we hit confirm to accept the gas fee. Hit confirm again, and boom, that transaction goes through. And now in order to verify, you can verify that the tra transaction is being sent. So I look at my MetaMask and it says the transaction is pending. I can actually view it on the Block Explorer, hence Etherscan. I can actually go inside of my my sanity database and see that I've actually done this drive. This is the trip. So on the left hand side, you can see we're under trips. So it was a trip to SoFi Stadium. You can see place I've dropped off in that ride, the pickup, the trip type, what was the trip price, what was the trip timestamp, and you can even see who the passenger was, which in this case was none other, your very own clever programmer. Now we go back and boom, look at that. The transaction is successfully completed. So the status now says success. Beautiful. So this is going to be a fun project that's simpler than some of the other ones we've we've built, but you're gonna have a little bit of an easier understanding. You can have an awesome project that you'll be able to put on your portfolio, and it's just gonna be fun. So I hope you're excited. And if you're ready to crush it, make sure to go ahead and smash that like button, turn it white, turn it blue. I don't know. I'll show you a picture of a potato today. That's kind of what I'm feeling. Here's a here's a potato. Hopefully you liked it. So it was a gift for you smashing the like button. Oh, by the way, your instructor today is going to be like last video actually let me see did we get over a thousand likes because his job depended on whether it was going to get over a thousand likes or not and if he gets under a thousand likes lance is fired that's what i've told you guys before Oof, just barely 1.4 k lance is going to be your instructor the world-class instructors runs our front-end mastery coding boot camp rushes it at that people love him hopefully you'll love him if this video gets a thousand likes or more lance gets to keep his job so do it for lance smash that like button i love your beautiful face let's go and let's start coding this up right away Way. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another video. Lance here again, and I'll be walking you guys through the Uber clone today. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I want you guys to do is create a folder and let's call it Uber clone blockchain, just like this. From there, let's go into that folder and we'll be creating our next J app within here. So to do that, go into the folder and write npx create next app at latest space dot the dot here after the latest is important because what it will do is take all the starter next.js files and put it into our uber clone blockchain folder awesome once that's done if you open up vs code now and open up the folder you should see all these files all the starter next.js files just like this as you can see okay after that i'm gonna go I'm gonna go ahead and set up Vercel. So to set up Vercel, it's very simple. All I have to do is, is go into the command line and type in Vercel. It's gonna ask you to set up and deploy. Go ahead and say Y for yes. And for scope, put your account. For us, we'll do Clever Programmer. And we don't have an existing project yet, so we'll go ahead and say N for no. It'll then ask you what's your project's name. Give it the same name as the name of the folder. Another important part here is in which directory is your code located. It's going to be at the root of the folder. And to showcase that, just put dot forward slash like this. Awesome. Last thing here, it's going to ask, do you want to override the settings? We can go ahead and say N for no. Cool. So if you hop over to Vercel and log in and take a look at your projects here, you should see the new project or cell project that we created. So for me, it's right here and it says just now because I just made it. So if it looks just like mine, you're good to go. So I'm gonna let this build 
and I will cut right back to when it's done. Awesome. So now that's done. I'm gonna go ahead and type in Vercel Dev, right? The reason why I'm saying Vercel Dev instead of Yarn Dev is because with Vercel Dev, I'm gonna be using the local Vercel Builder to run my code because I won't need to configure any ENV files because Vercel will actually take care of it. Another reason to use Vercel Dev over Yarn Dev is because it's gonna be easier to catch bugs that Yarn Dev doesn't. If you didn't know, the team that made Vercel is the same team that made Next.js. So Vercel supports a lot of the features that Next has already. Awesome. So again, Vercel Dev in the terminal and it should say the server started at localhost 3000. So go ahead and copy that link put it into your browser and you should see our starter Next.js app. Awesome. Next, let's go ahead and set up Tailwind. If you didn't know, Tailwind is a collection of CSS utility classes that we use to quickly build consistent, good looking CSS. So to set up Tailwind with Next.js, there's a couple of different steps we have. So if you're ever lost at any point, go ahead and hop over to tailwindcss.com slash docs slash guides slash next.js, right? And that webpage, you'll go and find a bunch of steps to set it up. So if you follow me, what I'm gonna do is say yarn add dash capital D, tailwind CSS, post CSS, auto prefixer, and that's it. We're gonna install all three of these packages with yarn. The next thing we're gonna have to do is actually initialize tailwind CSS. So after that's done, go ahead and write npx tailwind CSS init dash p. What this is going to do is initialize tailwind by setting up a tailwind.config.js. If you take a look in your VS code, you should see that same config.js file. Right, go ahead and click it and we need to configure our template paths. So what you need to do is just copy what I have here, right? In the content, we're going to put the value of dot forward slash pages and dot forward slash components, just like I have here. Cool. Next, we need to set up the next. We need to set up the Tailwind directives to our CSS. To do that, you're gonna copy all the things I have here and hop over to your styles folder, clear out all the starter code, and paste these three ats right here. So at Tailwind components, Tailwind utilities. Cool. Once everything is done installing, we can go ahead and set up our app again by saying Vercel Dev. And get started with Tailwind, go ahead and hop over to your index.js. As you can see, I have hello next.js here and you can see it on the browser. But to get started with Tailwind, let's give this a class name on line six and we can actually say bg-red-600, right? All we did was write a class name, but if you look at our browser, there's the background red at this color. If you're familiar with Tailwind is similar in the sense that all you have to do is type in the class name, what kind of CSS class you want. So there's predefined utility classes that you can write such as this to set up and style your CSS fast and easy. So let's move on to the next thing. I'm gonna go ahead and clear out the class name and we should be good to go. All right, if you saw earlier, I was able to use Tailwind to define a class name with what CSS I want. One thing to note is as our project scales, the class name is gonna get really verbose or insanely long. So one way to alleviate that is that we can actually make a style object at the top of our index here. And in the style object, we can give keys or give it an actual class name with all the CSS we want as the value. So over here, I'm gonna write const style equals an object, write wrapper as the key, and as the value, we can write something like this. Here we can define the height and the width like so. And also put flexbox. There you go, nice and simple. Okay, so now that we define that object, come down to line six and let's make that div that we need. So this div will have the class name, the style object dot wrapper. So if we put that there, I'll actually grab that value of the wrapper and it'll have all the styling that we need. So that means our wrapper will have the height and width, 100% and flexbox properties and the flex property of column. All right, another thing we're gonna do is set up a couple of divs for our whole app. All right, we won't have the CSS for this yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and set it up. So, so in the style wrapper, this is where our nav bar will go. In the next, I wanna make a div called style.main. This is where our map for Uber will go. And then a sibling to that main div is going to be style.rideRequestContainer, okay? Within that div, we're gonna make another div called style.rideRequest. All right, here is where we're gonna be able to type in a location and also confirm. So like I said earlier, we don't have the CSS for this just yet, as you can see, but I like to set it up so I know what to do later. I like to set it up now so I have an idea of how my project's gonna look later. So if you notice in line eight, this is where I'm gonna have a nav bar. So I'm gonna go start working on that now. So one of the first things we have to do is actually create that component. So in your components folder, type in navbar.js, right? And I'm gonna set it up by doing R-A-F-C-E. And if you wanna have these code snippets like I do, go ahead and type in your extensions, ES7 React Redux code snippets, and you'll be able to type in R-A-F-C just like I am. So instantly make function-based components like me. Okay, cool. So we made our navbar.js. Go ahead and like so, we need to write import navbar 
from dot forward slash slash components slash navbar. And bam, you can see it on our app. Let's go. So hop back over to your navbar.js and let's get started on creating our navbar. And if you notice, we don't need to import React onto this component because ever since React 16, it's kind of like implicit. All right, so your navbar component should look just like this and we should be good to go and get started. All right, so I'm gonna give this a class name of style dot wrapper. And of course we don't have a style object yet. So I'm just gonna set it up and we're gonna say wrapper. All right, and I'm gonna give it this height and this width and this background color. If you're confused at all of what the hell I'm writing, there's a Tailwind CSS cheat sheet that you can use to refer to understand what exactly am I writing to translate it to CSS. But yeah, so I'm gonna set the background to black, the text white, set up flexbox to justify around and say items center, All right, and the pixel length at 60 and say fixed Z-20. Awesome, cool. So if you save, you should see this nice little black bar which represents our nav bar. And at any point I move too fast, go ahead and pause the video so you can catch up. Cool, so once that's wrapper is done, let's go ahead and set up the rest of our divs before I get styling. So inside wrapper, let's make a div and call it style.left menu. Following that inside left menu, let's make a div called style.logo. And for the logo, we'll just say Uber. Awesome. Right after the logo div, let's make three divs like so. And let's put all the navbar elements, which is gonna be ride, drive, and more. All right, and three, all three of these divs should have the same class name. So I'll select all three and I'll say class name, curly bracket, style.menu item. Cool. And don't worry if you see all these items like a column, we're gonna go ahead and style that later, okay? You come over to, if you make a space between line 13 and 14 like so, let's add another div and call this one style.write menu, okay? And in that menu, this is where we're gonna write another menu item called help like so, right? And this, after help, the next menu item is gonna be where the user's name goes. So I'll just put my name, Lance, after that, Make another div, call it style.userImageContainer, and this is where your beautiful profile picture is. All right, so I'm gonna look up a user avatar, and this one looks good. So let me use this, save that image, and let me make a folder for these images. I'll call it temp, I'll put my beautiful picture of me inside this folder, and I'll call it avatar.jp.jpg. All right, and to use this image, all I have to do is say import image, from next slash image. All right, this is how we use images with next, but now let's actually import the actual image itself. So we're gonna say import avatar from the file path, which is gonna be just like this, okay? So to insert the image, let's type that with the source of avatar, and there we go, beautiful. We're done, guys, just getting up, we're done. But now let's actually just finish this up. So let's go on to the next part. Let's make another div on line 23. And what I'm gonna do is add a static wallet address, add a static number like so, which is gonna represent our static wallet address for now, but eventually it's gonna take up my wallet address when I log in with MetaMask, okay? So now that all the divs are set up, we can go ahead and start putting styling to them. So let's get rid of this ugly column, right? By saying left menu, flex, gap, dash three. Let's look at that, it's a column now. Let's make the logo bigger by putting this. And I'm gonna start moving a little bit quicker here, guys, because if I spent time explaining every single CSS, this video is gonna be like six, eight hours long, which would be pretty cool for one of the videos. But for now, if you need to, feel free to pause the video to see the CSS that I'm putting in. So I'm gonna put this for the logo. And for the menu items, I want the text size to be a little different than the logo. Make sure it's white, fonts medium. Let's add a nice cursor point to it. And of course, center it like so. Okay, let's do the same for the right menu and also center those items. Okay, our user image container needs a little bit of styling. So let's say MR-2. Let me give our image a class name of user image so we can actually start styling the image itself. Give it this CSS right here. Okay, hit save and that should look a lot better. I'm gonna go ahead and also put in the login button. All right, and I don't have the login button set up yet, but I'm gonna add the CSS right now. So login button should look like this and the login text should have this CSS as well. So then next, I'm gonna be setting up a variable called current account and this is gonna hold the user that logs in with MetaMask because later on in the video, I'll be authenticating the user through MetaMask. All right, so I'll be logging in real quick and I'm gonna copy my wallet address. And if I paste that, into the string here, that's gonna represent the current account that's logged in, right? And to make it, so what we could do now is replace the random set of numbers I have here and actually put, all right, I'm just gonna format a little bit by using slice like so, there you go. All right, so now we have a beautiful nav bar with all the menu item and my current static wallet address. We're gonna make this more dynamic later, so keep that in mind. Over in line 38, I'm gonna set up some conditional rendering. What this line of code is saying is basically, if there is a current account, take that current account and format it and take that slice so we can format it like so. If there is no current account, that means the user is not logged in. So we can set up conditional rendering. The div is gonna say, please log in. Awesome, so as you can see, if I remove the current account, 
it says to log in. And let's give it some styling by giving it the class name style.login button so that it look a lot nicer. Awesome. Next in your terminal, I'm gonna go ahead and add some React icons. You wanna use this icons for our project, so we're gonna need to install React icons. So hop over to your terminal and type in yarn add React dash icons. Okay, all right. Now that React icons is installed, let's actually use it by going over to the top here and writing import BS person from React icons slash BS. All right, now that we import it, we can actually just place it into our code. So let's just write that in line 46, like so. BS person self-closing and look at that. There's that little default avatar image right next to the login, just like this. Okay, so then I'm gonna bring back the current account and this is what it should look like if I am logged in. Awesome, so that's the nav bar. Let's go ahead and move on. Cool. So once the nav bar is done, one thing I like to just stay organized is to break down my code into small pieces and basically make a to-do list of what I want to do, right? So I'm going to do that using Notion and Notion is awesome because it lets me visualize my to-do list kind of like a Kanban board if you ever, if you guys ever used that before. So if you look, I have this nice three columns that says to do in progress and done, right? And every single time I finish one of these to do, I'm gonna update the status of it. So you're gonna see me hopping back and forth between Notion every time I finish to do, right? I recommend you guys use Notion, especially if you work in a team where you can divide up your task and everybody on the team has an idea what needs to be done. So if you look in my done column, actually, you can see that I already have cleanup code and connect for cell done. And if you look in the in progress, we have build nav bar. Well, we just finished build nav bar. So I'm gonna happily move this to done and there we go, beautiful. So the next things I want to work on is to build the location selector and to add the static cart list. And that seems to be good for now. So I'm gonna hop over to VS Code and start working on those things. So now that it's done, I'm gonna work on adding the map component to my project. So to start off, head into your components folder and let's create the map.js component. I'm gonna write map.js. I'll put my code snippet here and there you go, it's all set up. And now let's just insert that component here that I marked up. So in line 12, I'm gonna insert my map component. And of course, we also have to import it just like this. Awesome, there you go. So now that's imported, let's go ahead and set this up. One thing to note is that we're gonna be using map box for our map component. So to start using map box, we have to go back into the terminal and say yarn add mapbox-geo. As that's downloading, go ahead and hop over to mapbox.com. And now I'm gonna be walking you guys through on how to use Mapbox. So the first step is to actually sign up and make an account. And I already have an account, so I'm just go ahead and log in. So if you go into the account page of Mapbox, you should see this screen right here. From here, take a note on what you see. There's a default public token, and there's a button here that says create a token. So I'm just gonna copy this and save it. What you wanna do now is go over to Vercel. Now remember how I said Vercel actually sets up the ENV files for you? So if you hop over to your project on Vercel, there should be a section called environment variables. Okay, so in environment variables, paste the copied code into the value section. So it should look like this and name it map box that underscore access underscore token. Okay, cool, after that's done, it's all set up added the environment variable. And then once that's done, reset your terminal so that your ENV file is set up. Cool. While that's going on, I'm gonna use Mapbox. You need to import Mapbox.gl from Mapbox-gl. So I'm gonna set up our style object here and I'm gonna use this wrapper and style it like so. And within the map component itself, I'm gonna give this div after the return, the class name of style.wrapper. Now I'm gonna set up my use effect here. And what I want this use effect to do, basically create the map box when this component renders. So let's import use effect from React. And the side effect that we wanna perform, let me just clean this code up here for the use effect. Inside this use effect, I'm gonna write const map equals new map box, gl.map. All right, I'm creating a new instance of my map. And within here, I'm gonna set up a couple properties. Set up a couple properties. So for the style, I'm just gonna paste the map box I created on my account. And for the center, this is where you can put the coordinates where you wanna center your map on. So I'm gonna put this as my coordinates. But you can also set up the zoom, how close, how zoomed in do you want that center to be or the map itself. So I'm gonna say three. And oh, looks looks like it says I need the I need a container and it must be a string or an element. So I think I know what this issue is. I'm gonna make a container key and give it the same as this ID here, just like this. I'm gonna say map. And then now the next now the error says that I need the API access token. So let's go ahead and bring that over. So I'm gonna write mapbox gl access token equals our access token. So to get the access token, process env dot mapbox underscore token, like how we have it set up. So let me see if this works. Looks like I'm still getting the error. Let me just console log it to see what we get. So it's getting undefined. So it's not recognizing it just yet. Oh, 
I know why. I need to put dot next underscore public before the Mapbox access token. And I got to fix that up in my first cell project as well. So keep it the same name, right next public. That's important so that we can get the access token. And one more thing I forgot to do is click on create access token and insert your deployed link down below here in this URL so that you can restrict the access of this token to this specific URL that we have so that other people can't use your token. That's the whole reason why we put everything in EMV files because it's best practice not to share your API keys, your tokens, or anything like that. So by putting it here, you ensure that no one else can use it. So I already have mine set up, so it should be good to go. And I'm still seeing the error because I have to start my terminal again. So I'm gonna say Vercel dev, and this should work. Let's go, it's beautiful. It looks beautiful. We just need to make that container and increase the size a little bit. So I'm gonna go work on that now. So what I'm gonna do is hop back over to my index.js and I have those divs set up in my map, but since my index is the parent of that, it's still gonna inherit that style. Because if you look in line 15, my map component is still there. All the component is, is just hosts your UI element. So I can actually define the style still here. So I'm gonna write out the main that I have on line 13, the styling for that just like this. Then the map container, which is gonna be living inside the map component, and the ride request container. And of course, ride request, which will have the styling like this. So if I hit save, there we go. Now we're talking, like this looks a lot better. And with that, there's the map component. So now that I set up the map component, let's go remember to go back to our notion and add that to the done. Nice. So the next thing I wanna do, let's work on building the location selector. If you guys are familiar at all with the Uber app, there should be this white box where it, can, where it prompts you where do you want to be picked up from? And then where do you want to go? So I'm going to be working on this section. I'm going to be working on the location selector form. So hopping back to the VS code, if you look in your index, you can see in line 21, I marked out where I want that location selector to go, right? It's wrapped in this nice ride request, which is wrapped in ride request container. So following the pattern of what, I'm, what I've done before, I'm going to make a location selector component and set it up using my code snippet. And once that's done, I'm gonna set up my use state because I'm gonna be using this later. Coming down to line four, I'm gonna add the class name style.wrapper. And then at the top on line three, I'm gonna just make the style object with the wrapper. And this is the CSS that I want for it. So wrapper, awesome. So I'm just gonna set up the style object with the wrapper and the CSS value that I want for it. And within the style wrapper div, and I'm gonna call this the search header, style.search header. After that, let's set up our use state. And I'm gonna say const in focus, set in focus, and set initialize our use state with the key of from, All right? The idea here, I'm gonna set up the state for from, and then it's gonna to switch to two, right? Which will then in turn switch the focus between the two headers, the two inputs. Once that's done, let's go ahead and import location selector to our index, just like so. So I imported it and then I placed it in line 22. And in my location selector, I'm gonna set up some conditional rendering that if my in focus state is equal to from, I want the text, where can we pick you up to appear? If my in focus isn't from, or let's say two, it should show where to or where are we going? Right, and that's gonna switch depending on which input I have selected, which will make sense in a bit. And then now in our index, I'm also just gonna add this property so that we can actually put the container and see it by bringing the Z index up. So now we should see this white container with the text, where can we pick you up? Because our use state is set to from. Awesome. So in my style object, I'm gonna set up search header and I'm gonna set up input boxes. So input boxes is gonna be the class that I the hold the two input boxes, right? One's gonna be the location where I'm getting picked up from and the other input box is going to be where am I going to? So the next line in my style object is the actual input box and here's the CSS for that. And of course, if you remember the Uber app, if you click on the box, there's gonna be like this black border around it that indicates that's the box that is focused, right? And then I'm gonna style the actual input itself as well as setting up this property called vertical line. Referencing the app again, there's just gonna be this little circle that has a line going, which points to another SVG, right? And then all of that is in line with the text boxes. Cool, and then if I change the use state to two, you should see where to pop up. And depending on which one is focus, that use state should be changing as well. All right, so I have an extra focus input box here, so I'm just gonna delete that. What I wanna do now is to set up the rest of the div. So I'm gonna make another div here in line 21, and this will be where my input boxes div will go. And if you remember, inside this input box, there should be like this tiny circle that has a vertical line that goes down, which connects it to another SVG. So in line 22, I'm gonna put another div inside the input boxes, right? And if you look at the class name in line 23, I'm gonna put a template literal here, right? Because what I wanna do is if the focus is from, I want to focus and add that black around the input box to indicate that this is the box that I'm typing in or focused on. So 
what I'm saying on line 24 is if the in focus state is from, the focus input box will be the styled. And if not, this wouldn't have that focus input box styling. And then next on line 27, let me put the SVG container inside. So if I wanna get that small circle, I'm just gonna copy this right here. All right, feel free to pause the video so you can also get this SVG and I'm gonna paste it inside my SVG container. And if I save, there it is. There is my little circle, which is inside the focused input box. Make sense? Awesome. So obviously there's two input boxes that we need here. So I'm gonna set up another input. So inside this input box, there has to be an actual input. So I'm gonna place that in here. I'm gonna call this style.input with the placeholder enter pickup location. From there in line 16, I'm going to set up another state called pickup and set pickup and I'm going to initialize it to blank. The next state that I need to keep track of is the drop off location. I want to save that in a state as well. So I'm going to write const drop off, set drop off and set use state to an empty string. Cool. So within that input in line 39, I also want to add the value and inside here, I'm going to set it equal to pickup. And on change, we're going to update our pickup state with whatever value I typed in. So if I were to type in Santa Monica, the state pickup will have Santa Monica as the string because of this on change, keeping track of it. And the next thing I want to set up is the on focus, because if this is clicked or if this is focused, if this is the box that is focused, we need to make sure that the state is set to from, because what that's going to do is put in that border around this box, like I mentioned before. And like I said, I want that nice vertical line. So if I paste it right here, it looks like that. And this should connect us to the next input box. So all I have to do is pretty much copy and paste the rest of that over. The only difference though is in line 50, the in focus should be set equal to two and it's focused, right? Then that box should be focused. All right, next, I'm just gonna write out the SVG container in line 50. And inside this container, it should have a different one. This one's gonna be a tiny square, right? So this square is gonna be what connects that small circle SVG with the vertical line to the SVG square. All right, so it looks like this. It's looking good, guys. So let's add our input box with the placeholder. And of course, the rest where the value is gonna equal our drop-off state and the on change to update our drop-off to whatever I typed in. And of course, the on focus so that if it's focused, right, we switch the state. So look at this. If I click, where can I pick you up? Where to? Where? Let's go. This is looking super clean, right? I'm so excited. Awesome. So I'm feeling really good about that. It is looking beautiful, guys. So what I'm gonna do now is let's take a look at my inputs being passed. So I'm gonna console log our pickup and drop off state variables, and I'm gonna make sure it's easy to see. So if I were to type in these input boxes, you should see that console log. So I'm gonna type in Union City. All right, you can see it in my console down below. It's right there. And for the drop off, I'll say Empire State Building. All right, so now we can eventually take those states and start passing it through for our map box. I'm getting excited. I hope you guys are excited too. If you're still watching, put a like in the description below. Now that the location selector is done, let's let's go hop over to Notion and mark the build location selector as done. And let's go ahead and add build confirm to in progress. So in this section, I'm gonna be working on that car. When you, once you put in your information, what should pop up is the list of car options like Uber X, Uber XL, uh, Uber Black, anything of that sort. So to set that up, let's go ahead and make a confirm component. And if you remember the layout I have in my index, it's going to go here in line 24. So I'm going to import that confirm component in my index. And then let's hop back over to confirm and let's set it up. I'm going to quickly set up my style object at the top and let's make our first div. The first div is going to make is the wrapper. So I'm going to say class name equals style dot wrapper. From there, I want to make the container that's going to hold all types of rides. So I'm going to make a div and call it style selector container. In the next line, I want to make another div for the container of the button. So I'm going to say style confirm button like so. And inside that div, I'm going to say confirm Uber X from now. And of course, since this is a button, let's add an on click to that. When I click, we should run the store trip details function. So I'm going to set that function up at the top at line four. And for now, let's make it a async function, which will make sense in a bit. Coming back to the style object at the top, I'm going to add the selector container CSS. I'm going to style the selector container. And then let's go ahead and style the confirm button container. And so that our button can show up, let's style the confirm button itself. So there we go, there's the confirm button. There's a nice outline of the confirm button. So now that the confirm button's done, I'm happy to put this in the done section. Wow, we're moving fast guys. So the next thing is to add the static car list. So I have it marked out here in line 13 where it says ride selector. Let's go ahead and make the component for that. 
I'm gonna call this ride selector JS. And let's import that same component in our confirm JS. Right. There we go. And now we can see it in our browser to your right. And the idea with the ride selector is it should hold the whole car list. Like I was saying before, it should hold Uber X, Excel, Black, and so forth. So I'm gonna set up our usual wrapper at the top, set up our style object again. And then within this div, I'll be making another div and I'm gonna call this one style.title. In this title, I'm gonna put this text here, choose a ride or swipe up for more. From there, we should make a div for the car list in line seven. And I'm gonna hard code the list of cars in an object in line three. And the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna make an array of objects. One cool thing about Notion is that I can actually store all the assets in here. So if you go hop over to my Notion, here are all the assets of the different cars that we can select from the list. So what I'm gonna do is add these cards, each of these cars into my assets folder in my next app. So I'm gonna create an assets folder and put all of these into my next app. And don't forget the ETH logo and the Uber logo. Awesome, so now our assets folder with all the rides is here. All right, and once that's done, let's import all the assets we just set up. So import Uber X, Uber Black, Uber Black SUV, Uber Select, Uber XL. And going back to my array of objects here, each object is supposed to represent each car on this list. So in this first object, I'm gonna apply all the properties of it. So the name Uber X, the image is gonna be the Uber X image. And depending on what car option you select, it's gonna have a different price multiplier. So this is the price mu multiplier for the Uber X. And let me go set up the rest of the objects now. Awesome, so there you go. So now all the objects are set up. Let's go ahead and map through the car list. And real quickly, I'm just gonna change the key to this to service. Yep, and I'm just gonna update line 39 to class name. And within my car list, this is where I'm gonna map through the object. And for every car, I wanna create the necessary JSX to display it. So I'm gonna set up my map function here. And for every car, I'm gonna set up this div called style.car which will contain the image of the corresponding icon of the current car in the iteration. And that image will have the class name of car image with this height and width. And if I press save now, there it is. You can actually see all the assets there on the on my browser. Let's go. So let's now add the car details, which that's gonna go along with each image. So I'm gonna make a div in line 51 called style.cardetails. And within this div, let's make another div called style.service, where we can insert the car service that's describing. So if I put car.service in curly brackets here in line 52, we should see the Uber Black, Uber X, and all the others on my app. We're gonna do the same thing with the time. So I'm gonna make a div called style.time. They're all gonna save five minutes away for now. And for the price, remember, we're making this we're gonna be paying these cards with Ethereum. So in the div called style.price, I'm gonna be setting up a variable at the top in line 38 with the divide that by 10 to the power of five, and then multiply that with our car price multiplier. Set that to five decimals, and there we have our price in Ethereum. So again, let's also add a nice Ethereum logo in there with the image component from next. And let's not forget to import that ETH logo that I also have in my asset. So there it is. This is looking sick. Imagine paying Ethereum with Uber. Just to clean this up a bit, let's add more to our style object. So in here, I'm gonna make the title and add the CSS. I'm gonna add my Flexbox properties to car list with overflow scroll. And in the car div itself, set up the item center and a nice border. Set up the selected car CSS. And of course, the car image and the car details. And lastly is the service, make that the font medium, the time, the price container, and the price. And with that, all the divs are styled and it's looking amazing. And it all has the prices calculated with ETH based on the car multiplier. This is a lot going into this app. So be sure to like the video if you made it this far and I'll happily add static cart list to done. All right, we are making great progress, guys. So let's add setup sanity to our in progress now that that's done. And while we're here, let's also make that car list dynamic. And let's also add the get location coordinates to our to-do list. And if you look, we're actually almost done. Isn't that exciting? So let's keep on going. And here we go. Sanity is gonna be our database and we're gonna be setting it up by creating a studio folder in our terminal inside of our next app. And just to mention, if you go to sanity.io slash clever programmer, you can get a free boosted plan from us. All you have to do is follow these instructions right here to get started. You're gonna to have to NPM install the Sanity client. And when you're initializing Sanity, type in this code sanity dash dash coupon clever programmer, right? It's gonna include a lot more to the free plan that Sanity already gives to you. So go ahead and make good use of it. Awesome. Take that command and paste it into my terminal. And there you go. 
for the project name, let's just keep it the same, Uber clone blockchain, right? And then it's gonna ask, use the default data set configuration. I'm gonna say yes. All right, and we want a clean project with no schema. Cool. So you should see a studio folder inside your project. Hop over to the schema folder and go into schema.js. Here, you're gonna find out, this is where we're gonna basically concat all of the schema files that we create. So let's go ahead and clean it up. We can remove all these comments and awesome. The next thing we have to do is let's think about what kind of schema files that we should be creating. So the first one I'm gonna create in my schema folder is the user schema.js. In that file, I'm gonna create an object called user schema, and it's gonna have the, these keys and values. This is us letting Sanity know what kinds of documents that we wanna keep track of. So for us, we want a user schema because this is supposed to represent any of the users that log in. So when you think about what are important properties of a user, that would include these over here that I'm writing out, which would be their name, their wallet address, because eventually I wanna set this up with MetaMask as well as a profile image so that they can put a nice picture. And what we're gonna do each time we create a schema file, we need to import that schema like so, import user schema from dot forward slash user schema, and then take that and place it in line eight inside this dot concat. We're gonna be putting all the schema files we create inside here. So let's create another one. Let's call it ride schema. This file is supposed to represent the types of ride services we have. Remember we set up the static car list, like Uber X, Uber Black, Uber Black SUV. This is where we're actually gonna pull from Sanity the types of rides. So the properties that we need to keep track of is going to be order by ID. And the only reason I'm gonna use that is so that I can give it a custom order when I call it from Sanity. All right, we also need to give it a title and each type is gonna have its own price multiplier as you guys saw. So we're gonna also store that in this document. And lastly, we can't forget about the icon that goes with it to signify what ride type it is. Cool, so let's go back to our schema.js and add that file into the .concat. Awesome. Next, I wanna include another file here called trip schema, okay? And the fields that are gonna be important for this document is going to be the right, where are they getting dropped off to, the pickup, where are they getting picked up from, and the type of ride that they selected. Not only that, we also need to figure out and store what the price was, uh, a ride time stamp would be cool, as well as who the passenger is. So with the passengers, we need to keep a reference of the user that took this ride, right? It's gonna be different if a different user took the ride. Okay, cool. Hopping back into schema, I'm going to import that file as well into line 10, cool. Another thing that we should probably do is go into your terminal, hop into the studio folder and type in sanity start. Once you do that, we can hop over to localhost 3333 slash desk, which will automatically go for us. The cool thing about sanity is we can actually update our database from here with this really nice UI, All right? So if I click on users, rides, chips, we have nothing yet, but if I were to go to chips and click this pencil here, you can see all the fields that I set up in that schema file. All right, so if I wanted to actually add a document, I could do it from here on localhost, which is awesome, okay? So hopping back into the terminal, I'm gonna actually deploy our project to Sanity by saying Sanity deploy. And for the host name, I'll just say Uber blockchain. Let's go successfully deployed, which means I can actually hop over to Sanity, their website with that link. Anyone else who's a collaborator in that project will also be able to see this. All right, so now the studio is deployed to Sanity itself but I'm just gonna be editing on localhost for now. Cool. So after you guys do all of that, our Sanity database is now set up. Cool, so now that our database is set up, we only have these more, these two items to do left. Let's go ahead and make the car list more dynamic. What we're gonna do to do that is we're gonna start making, using Grok to query our database for the rides. All right, so going into our studio, I'm actually going to populate our rides with the assets that we have set up. I'm gonna take all the PNGs and basically create a document to represent a ride type. I wanna take the time to create a document for each ride type now. So I'm gonna give this an order by ID one, the title Uber X, and this is the price multiplier along with the icon that goes with it. So I wanna be doing the same thing for the rest of the ride types. Once I finished up creating those documents, I'm gonna go ahead and go inside the API folder of our app and we can go ahead and delete the hello.js. Instead, we're gonna create a folder called DB as well as another folder called map. And inside the DB folder, I'm gonna make a get ride types.js. In this file, this is where I'm gonna be querying for those ride types, okay? And in order to query the ride types, I'm gonna go back into Sanity and log in, click on my project, and we're gonna need a couple things from here. One of the first things is to see this project ID. We need to copy that and add that to our ENV variables, and we could do that using Vercel. 
Okay, after you copy the project ID, go back to Sanity and go underneath the API tab. We're also gonna need the token, right? And I'm just gonna give it the name client, generate and copy that token and go ahead and add that as an environment variable as well to Brazil. There we go, we have Sanity token underscore project underscore ID. Awesome. So I'm also gonna create a lib folder and within that, I'm gonna write sanity.js file. What I wanna do here is essentially set up my Sanity client. So to do that, I actually have to go back into my terminal and in my main project folder path, I'm gonna add do yarn add at sanity slash client. Make sure you download this inside your out of the studio folder and inside your project folder in the path, then you can add this command, okay? So what we could do in the sanity.js file, just say import sanity client from at sanity slash client like so, and let's create our client variable and set it equal to sanity client parentheses put in these curly brackets and create this object. So the project ID is going to be the same as we set it up, but we can actually call the process.env here. So I'm going to say process.env dot sanity project ID. Cool. And then for data set, I'll do production API version v1. And for the token, we can also call in our env and say process.env dot sanity token. Okay. And then for use CDN, I'm going to say false. There you go. We set up the sanity client. So now that that's set up, let's import that same client in our get write types.js like so. And here we can actually set up what we're querying for. The cool thing, if you go back to the local host 3333 and type in slash vision, what we can do is actually test out what we're querying. We can actually make a request to query through here. So what I'm gonna do is try to figure out how to get the rides that I want. And once you do that, you can get the list of rides, add these curly brackets here, and then we can kind of filter our query and make it more specific, All right? So the only things I really want from this is the service, the icon URL, and the order by ID. And a cool thing we could do is actually just order each of these by its ID, All right? So if I run this, I can actually see that this is what I get back, which is exactly what I wanted. So this is a really awesome tool by Sanity, which we can actually just copy this query and paste it into this variable that I have set up inside my get ride types.js. Cool. So now that we know what we're querying for, I'm going to create a ride types function and let's make this asynchronous. Okay. So within that function, set up a try catch. And if at any point there's an in our catch, we're going to send that error message. Okay. And in our try block, I want to make sure that we save sanity response in a variable and set it so that we await the fetch request for our query. And if that's successful, I want to send the status message that it was a success. Awesome. Okay, cool. Now that our query is set up, we can go ahead and actually remove the static car list that we set up earlier. So if you go over to ride selector, go over to the car list variable that we set up, you can just highlight all of this and delete it because now we can actually just pull the car list straight from sanity. So what I'm going to do instead of having the car list is I'm going to set up this use effect that will make that call to the database. Okay, so I'm getting error car list is not defined. I'm gonna go ahead and set up a use effect now. In here it says car list is not defined. So what I'll do next is actually just create a use effect here in line 27. And what I want to do is set up an asynchronous function. It's going to fetch the API route that we set up to get the ride types. Okay, and I'm going to store that in a variable called data. And I want to make sure we turn that response into JSON. Okay, what I want to do next is actually we're going to need to use the use state hook from React. Let's set that up at the top here in line 22. Cons car list and set car list. We can initialize the use state to an empty array. And from there, I want to do set car list in line 30 and set it to data dot data, right? Because I want to go get my variable and then the data within that variable like so. Which data that data should be what I queried for, which is the car list. Okay. And it seems like we're still getting errors. Okay. What I'll do now is what I think will fix it is go do export default get ride types because I can't forget to export this function. Okay. Ah, I see the issue now. It says res is not defined. And that's probably because I forgot to put res as a parameter as well. So I'm going to do rec comma res and it should work just fine. Hey, there's our query. Let's go. Okay, so I can take out this console log and I think I saw another error. Yes, so it says invalid source prop for the images because CDN Sandy is not config configured under images. I see. Okay, so what we need to do is just go ahead into your next.config.js. And if you have this issue, guys, set up an images key, which has the value of an object. And in that object, you need to put in the domains that we can allow this to use, which is the cdn.sanity.io. So now we should be allowed to use that. And if I hit save or sell dev again to run my project once more, fingers crossed. Hey, there it is. Let's go. Awesome. And after that, the car list is dynamic. 
Let's go. We are able to pull the ride types straight from Sanity, our own database. And this is looking amazing. So let's go ahead and put that to do item to done. Let's work on the next thing. All right, guys. So the only thing left in our in progress section is to get the location coordinates. What does that mean? Well, I want to be able to type in the location I want to be picked up from and where I want to be dropped off. And I should see that reflected on my map box, right? So to get that started, let's go ahead and create another file. And let's call this file get location coordinates. Okay. Within that file, I'm going to create a function. Let's create a function called get location coordinates. It's going to be asynchronous. And of course, we'd have to export this function. In that function in line two, let's set up our map box URL by making that a variable and setting it equal to the URL that we're going to use. We're going to make this URL dynamic. So what we're going to do is this. We don't have this yet, but I'm going to set up, I'm going to call on map box places API URL. We don't have an environment variable for that yet, but that's the URL where we can actually make this API call, right? Now to set up the endpoint, let's do a forward slash. Let's do rec.body.location, right? Put that in a template literal like so, and let's do dot JSON question mark access token. And that's going to equal our dot ENB mapbox access token, right? So like I said, we should probably set up that variable. So hop on back to verse your Vercel project. And in the name, I'm going to give it the same name that I have the mapbox places API URL. Awesome. As the value, put it, put the URL inside the value, add, and there we go. Awesome. So now this is actually going to work, right? What this URL is going to do, it's essentially going to use their API, make a request for the location that we pass in for mapbox. Awesome. So I hope that makes sense. What I want to do next is set up this try catch block in line four and let's set up our API call in the try block by saying const response is going to equal and let's fetch that response. And don't forget to set up an await here. The next thing you want to wait for is let's set up a variable called const data and set that equal to dot response dot JSON. So essentially let's turn our response to JSON. If that's successful. The response we get back is 200. So let's send a message that says it was success and set property to this. And of course, if anything goes wrong at all, Let's set up our catch, which will send us an error message, essentially. Beautiful. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go create a folder and I'm going to call this context. What we're going to do now is set up our context using React context. If you didn't know, React context is used for state management. Essentially, it will take our state and make it global so that we can access it anywhere in our app. So in order to do that, we have to set up that context. So from here, let's create another file and I'm going to call it Uber context. Awesome. So if we're going to use React's context API, let's import create context from React in our Uber context.js. And then in line three, I want to say export const Uber context equals create context. Let's, let's actually use that function we have. So I'm essentially creating a context for Uber. Okay, in line five, I'm going to do export const Uber provider equals, right? Notice how it's going to take in children equals, and I'm going to return here. I want to say, I'm going to return the Uber context dot provider. For now, we're going to set this value equal to empty, but whatever I pass into this value is going to be what I'm going to have access to globally. So keep that in mind. So in between the Uber context dot provider, put in the children that we pass in, and then we're going to need some other React hooks here. So I'm going to import use state and use effect. And at the top of our Uber provider, I'm going to set up a couple of state variables. Bam. There we go. So here are my state variables. I'm going to need to keep track of the pickup state, the drop off state, pickup coordinates and the drop off coordinates. Awesome. So I'm going to set up this use effect next. And here I'm going to set up this async and in, he, in the use effect, I'm going to set up the async function like so an anonymous async function in that I'm going to do an await promise that all. So I'm actually going to create a promise. So on line five, I want to say create location coordinate promise, which is going to take in a location name and the location type. So let's create that promise by returning the new instance of the promise object in JavaScript. This is what we use to create a promise. Okay. And then of course, inside the pro argument of the promise object, I'm going to, I'm going to put in an asynchronous function, which is going to have resolve or reject. And within that anonymous function, I'm going to make an await and it's going to essentially fetch, essentially going to fetch for the location coordinates. And I'm going to set that equal to the response. The next thing I'm going to do is set up Next, I'll write a couple headers here. The method will be post. In the headers, I want to put a content type. It's going to equal this. And the body, make sure to json.stringify and have this inside of the scope. All right. 
And then line 17, I'm gonna write const data equals await response.json. Awesome. So in line 19, I'm just gonna write an if statement that says if our message was a success, it's gonna to lead to a switch statement that's gonna say if the location type is pickup, set the pickup coordinates to that data and then break. Another scenario would be if the case is if the location type is drop off, then we're gonna update our drop off coordinate state with the data, okay? And of course, that would mean it's a result. Else, if the data.message was not a success, then the promise was rejected, okay? Then what I wanna do next is in the go back to the use effect and put if pickup and drop off exist, right? Make sure all the promises are resolved. We're gonna wait for all the promises and the promises that I'm gonna be waiting for is to be resolved is gonna be the pickup promise and the drop off promise essentially, okay? And in the dependency module line 56, let's put in the pickup and drop off. Okay, and let me highlight all of these lines. This actually should be within the scope of the Uber provider here in line 12, 12. Cool, amazing guys. So we set up the context as well as getting the location coordinates. Let's move on. Okay, cool. If I hit save though, I wanna notice an error in my console. You're gonna see a message that says something along the line, warning, each child in a list should have a unique key prop. If you ever see that, that means whenever you're mapping through something, it should also have a unique key prop that you pass down, right? So we can actually solve this issue by either giving it a direct key, right, for each one, or in your map function, it takes in a second argument, which we can name anything. I call it index, mostly because depending on how many items there are on, there are, that index will go from zero, one, two, and increment onwards. So what we could do is actually use that parameter and in our key and set that equal to the index. All right, now if I save this, boom, no more warning, we're good to go. And with that, our context is set up as well. Cool, so we can go ahead and move get location coordinates to done on our notion board. And we can also just put create context to done as well. And that means we're actually more than halfway done to this project. So congratulations if you made it this far, let's keep on crushing it. What I'm gonna do now is move a couple to do's to the in progress section again, which will be place pins on the map. All right, we need to put pins on where I wanna go and where I wanna be picked up from, as well as we need to be able to log in through MetaMask and lastly, save trip to Sandy. So those are the three things I'm gonna be tackling next. Once that's updated, let's get back to the code. The next feature I wanna work on is the functionality where I'm gonna be able to enter my pickup location and where I'm going, and there should be two pins that showcase where that is. So essentially add markers using Mapbox. So to get that done, let's hop over to our map.js, okay? And let's import all of the context that we need. So to do that, we're gonna say import use context from React, and we're also gonna import our Uber context from our context folder, just like that. Cool. And if I save this, we're gonna see this error. That's because I just forgot that we need to go to our underscore app.js file. And do you see this main component here, line six? We need to wrap that component with our Uber provider. So import Uber provider from context and let's wrap this in there. So what I'm gonna do is type in Uber provider. In between, you can put that component back in there. Cool, so now it's done. We now can do some state management within our app. So if you remember, if you go back to your Uber context.js, everything inside this value equals here is all the variables that I want to be able to access globally. If that makes sense to you. I'm gonna go add all of those variables now. As you can see, this is the list. Pickup, set pickup, the coordinates, all of that stuff. All of those wonderful things. So awesome. But now to actually use those variables, let's set up a destructured object. So let's destructure our use context. We can say const curly brackets, pickup coordinates, drop off coordinates equals our use context. And then you can pass an Uber context within that. Cool, so now I have access to those variables, I can implement it into my map. So what I'm gonna do is add a function here called add to map, right? So with this function, I'm gonna add those markers like I mentioned. So within that function, it's gonna take two parameters, map and coordinates. And within that function itself, let's make a variable marker one. And let's assign the new map box marker with these coordinates. So what I mean by that is we're gonna write mapbox gl.marker parentheses as you can see, and just do dot set longitude and latitude to the coordinates that I'm gonna pass in. And then just put in this add to map to just stick that pin based on those coordinates that we pass in. Cool, All right? So now that function is done, hop over to line 22. And I'm just gonna have a bunch of if statements here that if we have pickup coordinates, call the add to map function. And then line 26, if we have drop off coordinates, if that exists, add that to the map function. Okay, and then another if statement that I wanna add is if pickup coordinates and drop off coordinates exist, you wanna add this little function here to say map that fit bounds and then pass in those coordinates, okay? And if you remember how we have the pickup and drop off state set up, we're just manually changing it when I click. We wanna involve our context here. So we can take that state out now 
pickup and drop off state. We can take that pickup and drop off state now and let's incorporate our context API here. So I'm going to say import use context and import Uber context again, but this time in my location selector JS. So after you remove the pickup and drop off states, we don't need that. So let's involve our context. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to paste in our use context here and destructure it and get the variables that I need. So I'm going to need pickup, setup, drop off and set drop off. And you can set that equal to use context and just pass an Uber context. And of course, if you wanna actually do this, we need to import use context hook from React and Uber context from our context folder. Okay, let's type in Santa Monica and let's type in, I don't know, Sophie Stadium. Got an error, add to map is not a function. Okay, let me just take a look. It's saying add to map is not a function. Oh, I know, it's because let's put all those if statements inside this use effect. There you go. So try this again, Santa Monica and go to old Sophie Stadium. Oh, and look at that. We got an internal server error. We got an internal server error because cannot read property of zero. Oh, I see. One thing that you have to make sure when you're doing the Mapbox URL that your ENV files are the same name. So what I'm going to do here is actually update the end of this URL to now say a process that ENV next public because that's how I have it saved. All right. So I'm going to type in Santa Monica and let's type in Sophie Stadium as well. Sophie Stadium and bam, let's go. Those are the coordinates of those places. Awesome. So that error looks like I had to update my URL with the correct ENV name, which was next public access token. So once that's all good and done, we should be able to see the coordinates of what I typed in. Okay, so I'm just going to log the pickup coordinates and drop off coordinates inside my map.js just to see if I'm getting the same thing here. So again, Santa Monica and Sophie Stadium. Okay, let me just check inspect element and go over to my console. Let's see it, let's see it. All right, and the other array, let's go. So we're actually getting coordinates back, which is a really good sign. There you go. So now anytime pickup coordinates and drop off coordinates exist, then I'm gonna be able to fit the bounds here. So I'm gonna put that in the dependency module of my use effect in line 37. And now let's see it in action. Awesome, look at that, there's the two pins. So if you don't see anything right here, there you go, now it's zoomed in and now you can see the two pins, okay? Let me try to see if I can get the padding up more so that we can see a nice line. Let's just set the padding to 400 and I think it's fine. Awesome, so let's put place pins on map and our notion to done. In this section, I'm gonna be showing you guys how to authenticate a user using MetaMask, all right? So to do that, let's hop over into our context. Reason being is because we wanna be able to check if the user is logged in anywhere in my app. Head over to ubercontext.js and I'm gonna paste this code in here. So I'm gonna make a variable called let MetaMask. In line 13, we're gonna have if statement checking if the window is undefined. MetaMask is gonna equal window Ethereum. And the important part here is line 17. We're gonna have a function called check if wallet is connected. And it's gonna be asynchronous, of course. And in line 18, if the window.ethereum does not exist or is not there, we just wanna return. That basically means if you are not logged in, don't do anything. Okay, from there, I'm gonna set up this try catch block and in the catch, if there's any sort of error, we're gonna console log error. In the try block though, I wanna make sure I set up a variable called address array, just like so. And I'm gonna set this equal to, to an await, window.ethereum.request, essentially make a request for an account. And in line 24, if the address array dot length is greater than zero, or there is a valid wallet address, this is where we wanna set the current account. So let's actually make that and keep track of it using state. So in line 10, I'm gonna say const current account and set current account equals use state. And you're gonna place that in line 26, set current account to the address array bracket zero. Okay, and underneath, I'm gonna have this function here, request to create a user on sanity and pass in the address array bracket zero as well. And obviously we don't have that function yet, but what I wanna do with that function, make a request to our database to create a user document if it doesn't already exist. So let's actually set up that function. Let's make a request by setting up this function. So in line 80, I'm gonna say const request to create user on sanity equals asynchronous, and the parameter is gonna be the address that I pass in. And of course, if we're not logged in, or if there's no window.ethereum, just return. Okay, set up another try catch block, and in the catch block, do another usual error, console log the error, awesome. And I wanna stop there for now, because what I need to do is actually create a file. So under my API folder, under DB, let's make a create user.js. This is where we're gonna make a request to our backend to create the user. So let's import the client at the very top here. So import curly bracket client from our lib sanity folder. And then here in the variable, I wanna put const create user insanity. This is actually the function of us creating that user document, which we set up with our schema. Okay, so it's gonna equal async rec 
response. And of course we have to export it at the bottom. And within that function, let's set up the try catch. Okay, and in the catch, we're just gonna send a status of error with the error message. And in the try block, like I said, this is where we create the user document into our database. So in the try block, let's write const user doc equals the object. All right. So within that object, think about the properties that this user document should have. So the type should be users, of course. The ID is actually going to be the wallet address. So we can say rec.body.user wallet address. The name will be rec.body.name. And the wallet address would actually be the user wallet address as well. Okay. After we set up that object in line 12, let's set up the await client.create if not exist user doc. The cool thing about Sanity, if that document doesn't exist, Sanity will create it already. It'll already check for us if it exists or not with this method. And of course, pass in the user doc. And that's just something really cool that Sanity does. And of course, if that is successful, send a status of 200 message saying it was a success. Awesome. So now that we were able to create user insanity function, we can hop back over to our Uber contacts. And in line 83 in that try block, we can make the fetch request there. So do do await fetch and the API route that we just set up to create a user. And if you think about it, what kind of request is this? Are we trying to get data or are we trying to post data? We're trying to post data. So for the method, I'll say post because it's gonna post a new user to our DB. And if everything I just said was just new information to you, leave a comment down below, letting me know if you want me to go fully in depth on APIs and how to call an email. Awesome, let's get back to the video. Like I said before, we're gonna create, this is gonna be a post. So in the headers, I'm gonna put this as my headers and in the body, just say JSON and pass in the values we wanna give to that user document which is going to be user wallet address is going to have the value of the address that i pass in the name for now i'll put blank but one thing we can actually do is hop into your terminal and let's do yarn faker at faker dash js slash faker if you aren't familiar with faker js it's basically a javascript library that can generate fake data for you so in our case i want to use faker js to get a fake name so it will randomly generate a fake name for me and in order to use that i'm going to have to go import at the top of uber context and in order to use faker js we have to import faker from at faker js slash faker and now we can use it coming back down to line 91 so instead of an empty string we can actually just say faker dot name dot find name this will randomly generate a fake name when i create the user next on line 19 of the uber context.js let's set up a use effect that will check if the wallet is connected. Like I said, we wanna be constantly checking if the wallet is connected. Otherwise, you shouldn't be able to use these features. And the trips that you set up should be associated with who's ever logged in. Okay, so in the use effect, I'll put check if wallet is. And now let's actually make a function to connect the wallet. So in line 39, I wanna say const connect wallet equals async and the anonymous function. Again, you're gonna see that this is the same kind of deal. In the inside this function, in the if statement, I'm gonna say if there's no window Ethereum, just return the usual try catch block console logging in error and in the try block we're gonna set up the variable again for the address array and await window.ethereum.request because we want to request a metamask account and if there is a valid account right with this if statement if address array dot length is greater than zero then we're going to set the current account to the address array as well as make a request to create the user on sanity if there is one and again pass the address array and don't forget once we create those functions i also want to pass that down here to my provider so that i have access to them anywhere in my app so i'm going to one line 30 and let's pass in connect wallet and current account okay and now i'm going to my navbar.js because if you remember way back in the beginning of this video i set up a static variable holding the current account over here in line 17. we don't need that anymore because we actually created all the functionality for us to log in already so let's remove the static data and at the top I'm going to import all of my contacts and let's bring in those variables that I created. So I'm going to import use context from react and import Uber context from my context folder. And inside the function component of navbar in line 20, I will set up the context and destructure it by saying const current account and comma connect wallet equals use context and pass in Uber context. Okay, cool. And I hit save and you can notice that it still looks the same, but that's because for me, I'm already logged in, right? So I'm just gonna copy my wallet address for now because I'm actually logged in. So it's, that's why it still looks the same. Let's go ahead and check on my sanity and click on users. There we go, it generated a new user, right? So when I'm logged in, it created a user. Apparently my name is gonna be Kim for today's build. Cool, again, go into your sanity and your local host 3333. 
You can actually click on the user document that was created. For me, it's Kim. So if I click on it, you can see the fields are now updated with the information I passed in. It generated that fake name for name and it passed in my wallet address, which is correct. That's it. And of course, what we set up is working. When there is a current account, it's gonna format that long wallet address using the current account that's like so that it looks really nice on my front end. But that's what it looks like if I logged in. Currently, we don't have any feature to actually log us in. So coming down to 145, let's add an on click and use that global state that I passed in, which is to on click, I wanna be able to pass in the connect wallet function. And that makes sense. If I click the login button, I should be allowed to connect my wallet, just like that. And another thing that we need to do is when I log in, I should actually pull the user that's connected from my database. All right, so if I log in, my name is Kim, right? From Sanity, I should able, be able to pull Kim's information if I already have a user, okay? So in back into my Uber context.js 119, I'm gonna make a function to request to get current user info. All of this is always gonna be asynchronous, pass in the wallet address because I wanna use the wallet address and, and query that with my database to see what user has the wallet address that I pass in. And that's what I wanna to set to the current user. Within that function, set up the try catch again, and we're gonna catch any errors by console logging it. And in the try block, I'm gonna say const response equals and await for the fetch call of getting the user info and pass in the wallet address. So like I said, I'm gonna get the user info with the wallet address that I pass in. So again, if it already exists, we're gonna get that information. So up at the top in line 12, let's set up a state for the current user. And if we get a response, let's set the current user to data dot data. And if you notice, we actually don't have that API route set up. So in my DB folder, let's create the get user info.js. And can you guess what we're going to do next? We're going to import the client again. So importing the client in line three, creating the asynchronous function for get user info, pass in rec and res. So just like before, when we get the ride types, I'm going to set up a variable called query and pass in how I'm going to query for the user info. So I'm just going to paste it, take a look at what I typed in. All this means is I'm going to ask for a user with the wallet address of the wallet address that I passed in. And what I want from that user is the name, the wallet address again, and the profile picture if there is one. So I'm gonna store all of that in a sanity response variable down here at line 12 and set it equal to an await of the client fetching the query that I passed. And if that's successful, send the status of two. And if it's not, send the status of 500, okay? So I just created that in my context. All right, so in line 24, I'm gonna add another user effect here to check that if there is no current account, let's just return. But if there is, let's make a request to get that current user's info. So I'm gonna set that up in a use effect so that it can run when it loads. And in the dependency module in line 27, pass in current account, of course, because you only want the use effect when the current account state is updated or changed. Okay, and let's pass in current user into our provider and in our nav bar, .js, let's add current user and destructure it from our contacts in line 20, okay? And if you remember in line 31, this is where I passed in my name, but let's pass in the current user. Let's make it more dynamic. So in line 31, let me add the curly brackets and paste current user dot name dot split. So I don't need to get every single part of that name. So I'm gonna use split here in line 33 and I'm getting cannot read property of name of undefined. So let me just console log current user real quick and take a look at that. It is a big part of programming. Let me go take a look. Cannot read property name undefined. And I'm also getting a 500 internal server error. Okay, next thing I wanna try is going into get user info. I think the reason is because the sanity response, I wanna get back the first user. So in line 18 in my get user info, where it says the data key in the response.send, I need to do sanity response bracket zero. Let's see if that works. Save, hey, there it is. There's Kim, awesome. Now that's done, we actually completed two things with our Notion. We completed create a new user on login, as well as we're able to add MetaMask login. So mark those as done, let's go. Bring over calculate price now and we should be good to go. Awesome. So now let's work on saving trip to sanity. All right, if you remember, we create a schema that's gonna save all the trips that we take. So in order to save trip to san save our trip to sanity, let's go to the confirm JS. And if you look in line 22, we have a function set up called store trip details. At the moment, it doesn't do anything if you look. So let's go ahead and get that done. So like before, we're gonna need to make a trip document and pass in all the information. What we wanna pass into store trip details are two things, the pickup location and the drop off location. Okay, so coming back to the function in line 11, in the parameters, put pickup and drop off. 
make it asynchronous, put in a try catch block again, console lock the error, and in the try block, we're going to make an await for a fetch call at this API route for save trips. And again, don't have that set up just yet, and we'll do it much later, but think about this, with this API call, are you making a get request or a post request? If I'm saving a trip to my database, it should be post. So for method, I'll put post. And for the headers, I'll put this content type application slash JSON. Cool. And of course, for the body of that, I want to make sure that I pass up the key pickup location as the pickup that I passed in and the drop off location to be the drop off state that I pass it. Okay. And if you remember, there's a reference to the user that took that trip. If I put this in my input Santa Monica to Sophie Stadium, that shouldn't go to Kazi's account. That should go to the users that's logged. In our case, it's Kim. Cool. So make sure that's set up for the body key. Now let's import all the context that we want to use for this app and let's destructure all the variables from our use context in line 13. So I want to get the const current account pick up and drop off from use context. Don't forget to pass in Uber context and we should be good to go. So now, now we're able to actually pass those in those values because they are exist in this component. Okay. So heading over to our DB folder, create that file now and call it save trips.js at the top of that file import the client and create the function save trips make it asynchronous with the parameters of rec and res the user will try catch block again and if you notice a lot of the same things you do when you're setting up routes with the apis to sanity with the cloud functions for sanity it's going to be a lot of the same thing so in the catch i want to send a message of 500 server error we need to be able to create the trip document that we're going to post to sanity. So I'm going to set up const trip doc equals object. What kind of document is this? So you're going to say underscore type is the trips. The ID is going to be the wallet address plus the date. We're going to use the date object to put in the date of when the trip happened in the pickup. We just get the pickup location and the drop off location that's passed in. Next, I'm going to actually put in the ride timestamp and format the date so that it looks nice when I post it. The next key that I want to put to this trip document is the passenger key, which actually has the value of an object again. And it's going to have underscore key as the first key, which will have a little string here that says the passenger with the wallet address, as well as the date, which I will format once again. Next is here, you want to put reference as the key. And what we're referencing is the user that's logged in. So I say rec.body.user wallet address. And what type, the type of this is going to be a reference. Essentially, what that means is whatever trip that I take, it should reference the user that took. Okay. Another thing that I want to pass in is the price of that trip, as well as the selected ride to be the value of whatever the selected ride was. And if you notice, I actually don't have the price and selected ride property set up. So from my use context, let's add price and selected ride on line 13. In my Uber context.js, let's create those two states for selected ride and price and pass it down into value. So when I'm actually destructuring them, it, it can have access to it. Cool, set up now, okay. Now time to update our save trips document. So go to save trips.js. We can also add the price and ride category. So for the price, well, I'm just gonna do up with parse float and pass in the price. And for ride category, I'm just gonna write rec.body.selectedride.service. Then going into the ride selector in this use effect, let's actually set the selected ride to be data.data .data bracket zero. Okay, and then coming down to line 43 of the ride selector, I'm just gonna paste this in. I'm gonna paste this in. This is gonna change the class name of that div with this ternary operator saying that if there is a selected ride.service equals the car.service, then the style is gonna be that selected car. If not, it's just gonna be the regular style.car. All right, so if I save this, selected ride is not defined. Cannot read properties of undefined reading service. All right, so I think what I'm gonna do now is go to the context or Uber for the set selected. I'm gonna pass in an empty array. And of course, I can't forget to pass set selected ride into my value of the provider. And don't forget in that value, pass in set price as well. And of course, in line 22, I don't want to put this in a use state. I'm going to set this up. I'm going to set up use context here. Okay. And don't forget to import use context and import our Uber context so that we can pass it in. And in ride selector, I'm going to try putting using state to put my car list and set car list here instead. I'll put use state and import it up to, instead of passing it through context. And I hit save. Any errors? Let's go. It works. So what I could do now, once this loads, you can see that if I click on any of these cars, it will have the styling of selected car. And that's what that ternary operator was for before. Nice. Okay. And then in my save 
chips. Can't forget to add in line 22 in my save chips.js client that uh, let's use the method to create the document if it doesn't exist and then send that status message. I click on Uber Black. I hit confirm. Let's see what happens. Let's go. We got a trip. It's untitled. The trip prices. There's the there is the trip type, the timestamp, and of course we didn't enter a drop off or pickup, so that's not going to show up. So that should be blank. So now I'm going to try to enter a pickup and drop off location. So again, I'll use the same example, Santa Monica, Sophie Stadium. There we go. You see the pins, Santa Monica and Sophie Stadium. There are the pins. Click on black SUV, confirm. Let's see if that's there. Awesome. So we're able to save the trip to sanity. There might be a little bugs here and there, but we'll work on that. Cool. So it looks like we're able to save trips now. So let's go ahead and mark that as done in our notion. And looks like next is let's just calculate the price. If you look at our notion, we only have two more things left. All I have left is to calculate the price and then actually charge the user with that pricing. Because at this point, we're actually able, if I reset my sanity here, we're actually able to see the save the trips and the price and the reference to the user, which is amazing. All right. And when I talk about calculating the price, if you look at the list of rides, what you see here in Ethereum is actually just the price multiplier itself. What Uber needs to do is calculate the base price first. So what I mean by base price is this. The base price is essentially the length of the trip in seconds, right? And we can figure out with the Mapbox API, adjusted to traffic at a given time, obviously. What we'll do is we'll call the API that will get us the length of the trip in seconds based on the current traffic. Then we're gonna divide that by 10 to the power of five, just to get a realistic price of the calculation when we send it back in Ethereum. This is not exactly what Uber uses or the formula, but what we get back is something along the lines of a realistic price that we get. So essentially that's the formula. So let's get coding. So let's dive right in to the pricing. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is within my map folder, we actually need to get the duration or the distance in seconds of the trip, like I mentioned before. So in your map folder, create a get duration.js, set up an asynchronous function like this, and we're gonna make another API call to calculate that. So make a variable called mapbox URL, set it equal to this string. So, right, we want to make use of our env variables here. So process that env mapbox directions API URL. We're going to get the pickup location, the pickup coordinates, the drop off coordinates, pass in the token. And after that, we make a try catch response. And then let's set that equal to an await where we make fetch request to the mapbox URL that I set up. Once that's resolved, set that variable to data and we're gonna make another await, turning that response to JSON. And if that's successful, send a stat of success. And of course, in our catch, it will catch any errors, sending a status of 500, meaning internal server error. So let's set up some more context. Going back to Uber context JS in line 15, I'm gonna set up my use and create a state variable called base price and set base price, just like that. Okay, within here in line 32, we need to set up another use effect. In a dependency module, I'll put up if the pickup and coordinates, drop off coordinates change. That's the only time I want this use effect to run. And if there is no pickup coordinates or there's no drop off coordinates, just return. Otherwise, I'm gonna set up this asynchronous function and make an await fetch call to get the duration. All right. And from there, I wanna post the pickup coordinates and the drop off coordinates and send that over to my get ride types API that I set up. All right, so I can take out, going back to ride selector, I can take out that base price that I had set up. I'll actually just pull that from my context, which means don't forget to set it up in the value to add all those variables that we need. So add to my Uber context provider in the value and in the confirm.js file. Let's go into our confirm.js and in line 47 where it says confirm here and selected ride that service. We also want or to write or Uber X because we want either or to show up. If one doesn't exist, the other one will pop up. And so now what we could do is coming down to line 47 is add some curly brackets here and make sure that all of those variables exist. So we can say pickup coordinates and drop off coordinates and ride selector. Hitting save now, it says Uber X is not defined because it thinks it's a variable. Just put that into a string and it should be fine. So I'm just gonna type in Santa Monica, Sophie Stadium. Let's see if it's gonna calculate the price. Let it load for a second. Awesome. Okay, cool. So once the map box settled, we can look over by the price and it actually says nan, right? So it's some point it's not actually sending back a number. So let's go check this out at ride selector. Let's console log what we're getting back as the base price. Okay, let me just check out this error data. Only absolute URLs are supported. So what that tells me is to go into get duration and let's just console log the map box URL just in case. Okay, I'm just gonna reset my terminal by running cell by clearing it and then running Vercel dev again. I'm gonna type in the I'm gonna type in Santa Monica and Sophie Stadium. Let's see what comes up. I'm gonna hit enter. 
All right, so our pins are working. And if you look, there is the price. I'll hit confirm and let's take a look. Hey, there we go. That's the trip price. Let's go. So not only we are able to calculate the price now, we're still also able to save that as our trip with the new price. This is looking amazing so far. Okay, with that, we can move calculate pricing to done. And there we go. We have one thing left. If you guys made it to this video and you're at this part in the code, you are crushing it. So with the last step we need to do is just charge this user and let's deploy the whole thing to Vercel. Are you guys still excited? I'm excited. Let's keep on coding. We need to charge this user with the price that we calculated, meaning we're going to send a request to charge them to mask. So let's hop over to our Uber context and let's add that MetaMask variable in there that I set up previously. Okay. Going into confirm.js, let's add that MetaMask variable in our Uber context in line 13 so that we can call it in our confirm.js and go over to your store trip details within the trap, the try block in line 40. Let's make an await here and do metamask.request, we can send that transaction over. All right, so the method is eth underscore send transaction with the params being from and the value of that being current account. And then for two, we can send it to process.env next public Uber address. So you guys should know what that means at this point. Essentially, we're using the next public Uber address as the wallet where you're going to send money to. So think of this as us sending money to Uber. If you guys want to send me Ethereum, go for it. This is my wallet address. Okay, but yes, I can switch between these two wallets so to prove the payment. And of course, we don't have that environment variable set up. So let's set it up in Vercel. So going into Vercel and under the environment variables tab within name, make sure it's the same. We learn from our mistakes. Let's type in next public user address, paste in the wallet address that you want to send money to, which you consider as Uber. And let's add that in. So now we're actually able to use that. So essentially what I did is I am going to send money based on the price that is calculated and we're going to send it over to Uber. Quote unquote. So of course, whenever you make a new environment variable to Vercel, let's reset our terminal and type in Vercel dev again to run the project. And of course, we have to make this gas property here and type this in. And for the value, paste this in and pass in price. Okay. So just to clear my terminal, let's also make sure to yarn add ethers because we're going to need that in order to let this run. That's why you see this error can't resolve ethers. Let's import. So if we, once we do yarn add ethers, go ahead and import ethers in your confirm.js rerun your terminal again and I'm just going to refresh my page and there we go no more ethers error very nice so I'm going to just try this out again I want to type in Santa Monica but let's actually go to Marina del Rey there we go and that the pricing looks good so let's confirm that ride let's hop over so what should happen when we confirm the ride is that we should be able to send our transaction to that Uber account and there we go look at that we're going to get a notification saying that this account is going to the price that I calculated to the Uber wallet that I set up and if you look at the details you can actually view this on etherscan to verify that this was an actual transaction that you guys made on the rinkaby testnet and since it's actually sending it to that testnet it's going to take a couple minutes to update the blockchain and voila success awesome all right so we were able to send money to the uber account amazing so let's go we finished everything in our notion and the last thing we need to do is make sure we deploy to Vercel. So again, I'm going to write Vercel here to upload what we have to my Vercel project. Are you guys ready to deploy? Let's do it. Okay. So once you do that, you should see that it's building and we can watch that over here in the overview and we see the most beautiful line at the bottom there done. And if you click on this link, you should see the actual code live in this deployable link. So you can send this to your friends, your mom. This is amazing. So be sure to add this to your portfolio. And if you thought this tutorial was amazing, feel free to drop a like down below. And if you haven't already, watch our previous tutorial on Twitter. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.